All right. Uh, thanks for coming today, everyone who's here live in the room and everyone who's on Zoom. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our very own Jared Cochran today. She is currently a lecturer in sustainability studies, teaching um, several really important courses in our programs. Um, and she is also the faculty director for Ecosystems and Human Impact. She earned her graduate degrees at the University of New Mexico and is a recent winner of the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. Um, partly because of her efforts to develop the really compelling authentic research experience, um, courses that are commonly known as the Worm Lab, through which over 400, about 400 students have passed, um, and which she teaches in a sensor style. Um, and one thing I'm really impressed with, she's integrated these courses into a really successful research program over the last few years, publishing two or three papers a year uh, so far with about 70 undergraduate students and over a dozen high school students as co-authors. So the students are not only getting an authentic research experience, but they're getting authentic scientific output uh, from it, a bunch of them. Um, the work she's doing in with those students in the Worm Lab has also laid the groundwork for uh, collaboration between Sharon, myself, and Liliana Davalos. We've written a couple of proposals so far to NSF. We haven't quite uh, hit the nail on the head yet, but we are going to keep trying. And uh, maybe we'll hear more about that in her talk today. And I won't read the title because she already has it up there. So Sharon, take it away. Thanks for that introduction. The um, title of my talk is Below the Surface, How Herbicides Are Driving Biodiversity Changes in Soil Ecosystems in the Anthropocene. The world currently holds 7.9 billion people. This is a photo of light pollution over North America on an average night. The Anthropocene is defined as the time period in which human activity is the dominant influence on climate and the environment. And these first few graphs up here, I feel like someone could have made all of these graphs, but these first few show the impact of human activity on atmospheric systems. These middle ones show the impact of human activity on marine systems. And at the bottom, which is where the focus of my research lies, they show the impact of human activity of the Anthropocene on terrestrial systems. You can see from these three graphs that since the 1950s, there's been an increase in domesticated land, an increase in tropical forest loss, and an associates, an associated degradation of the terrestrial, terrestrial biosphere. This is another way to show the impact of human activity on the globe in the area in which I'm worried and concerned and, and working. And that has to do with cropland. All of these bright green areas show places where we are currently growing crop plants to feed our nearly 8 billion people and our livestock, because a lot of these, um, a lot of these fields are used to feed our cows and our pigs and our chickens. To feed 8 billion people, we've had to do something that's really clever, and that includes genetically modifying a whole bunch of plants so that they can withstand agrochemicals, primarily glyphosate, but also decamba. And what you're seeing in this picture here is something that's pretty stunning. For those of us who are coming out of sustainability, maybe we look at this picture and we're like, oh, the monoculture. And maybe those of us who had some classes might worry about what would happen if disease would hit this, this field because essentially this is a cloned field. But another way to look at this is that this is really remarkable efficiency and a really powerful way to feed as many people as we have to feed. I'm focusing on the food, but I want you to realize that this is actually a cotton field for our clothing. 
And um, we also have to worry about the things that we're growing for our housing. If we were to say, take a step back from the way that we are currently growing our crop plants, we reduce our efficiency. So these are three major crops with three major crop pests. This is ryegrass over here at the bottom. Uh, we've got amaranth and we've got water hemp. And these are common pests for uh, cotton, soybean, and corn. We're really familiar with some of the costs associated with our modern agricultural system. And we've been really busy studying the impact of um, modern agriculture on biodiversity and on uh, farming efficiency and maybe terrestrial outputs. This graph right here was published in Science in 2018. And the title of the paper that it came from is called Wicked Evolution. Can we address the sociobiological dilemma of pesticide resistance? This graph on the left shows you what happens via evolution when you rely on agrochemicals. And in this particular case, it's glyphosate. Before 1995, there were no major crop plants, pests that were resistant to glyphosate. But by 2020, you can see that we have 45 major weeds that are resistant to glyphosate. This graph over here, oops, sorry, this graph over here on the right is maybe more alarming because each of these colors represent different modes of action that herbicides use to kill plants. So this pale blue one right here, which says EPSPS synthase inhibitors, that's glyphosate. And that is this line right here. And what this graph is showing us is that regardless of what mode of action herbicides are using to kill plants, plants are responding by saying, hell no, we won't die, and they're developing resistance. There are, oh my gosh, how did that happen? Wow. Sure didn't know that could happen. Um, it seems like a subliminal message that I just passed in front of you. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the, uh, one of the hallmarks of the Anthropocene is, of course, the, its impact on biodiversity. And uh, there was a foundational paper published in, again, in Science Magazine in 2018, which shows that for mammals, for birds, for reptiles, particularly for amphibians, the rate of extinction is pretty alarming. The, threaten, the number of threatened species in each of those um, taxonomic groups is about 30%. Last year in April during the pandemic, maybe we were worried about our own apocalypse, but there was a paper published in Science that had the that generated the alarming headline "Insect Apocalypse," and uh, people have been worried about insects in in uh, terrestrial settings and their so-called decline. But it turns out, uh, so this science paper conducted a meta-analysis and it turns out that the impact of the Anthropocene on insects is a little more nuanced than was suggested by the title Insect Apocalypse. So up here, you can see the insects that live in um, faunal area, I'm sorry, in terrestrial areas. And the red indicates that the populations are in decline. Down here though, this gives us a little bit of hope Insects that are associated with freshwater ecosystems are doing fine. Another way to look at that is these graphs down here. So the blue indicate insects that are living in freshwater ecosystems and the brown ones are insects associated with terrestrial systems. And you can see that everything below the dashed line is demonstrating populations that are in decline and everything that's above the dashed line are doing fine. You can see that globally in Europe and particularly in North America, Insects associated with terrestrial ecosystems are facing population decline, which, you know, in, in the age of the Anthropocene, we've been worrying about things like polar bears and cheetahs, but maybe we should be thinking about smaller, more nameless things that live closer to the ground. The worm lab, I, I'm thankful that Jackie described it as she did, because it's actually a suite of classes. It's um, but the worm lab has been focused on a very particular part of 
uh, the Anthropocene, and that is the impact of soil pollution on biodiversity. And my lab specializes in two things. We look at plastic pollution, and we look at um, the pollution associated with big agriculture. If you want to hear more about the impact of plastics on soil ecosystems, you'll have to invite me back for a different talk because today I'm just going to focus on the things associated with big agriculture. If you look at, I invite you to imagine when you're looking at this picture labeled A, this is from a 2021 paper published in PNAS, and this is Brazil right here. And I want you, I'm inviting you to imagine the biodiversity loss associated with this picture right here. I don't know whether this was a rainforest or pampas, but just to get to the point where this fleet of tractors is planting, we had to knock down trees, bracken, monkeys, birds, insects, frogs, lizards, and probably things that I'm not even thinking about. And that's just to get to this point right here. Now, what these tractors are planting are Roundup Ready soybeans. Most of the Roundup Ready soybeans that we plant in South America, we grow to feed our pigs and our cows and our chickens. But I don't want to focus on that exactly. What I want to focus on is what's happening with these tractors and biodiversity. They are going to plant a monoculture of soybeans. And that in itself is a pretty dramatic impact on biodiversity. But then those soybeans are going to be sprayed with glyphosate. And that glyphosate is going to be carried through the plant system into the roots and into the bottom 10 centimeters beneath the roots of these plants, impacting not only the things that are on top of the soil, but the biodiversity below the soil. And just for your own interest, this picture right here, this is a park, a remnant forest in Indonesia. As far as the eye can see, as far as the drone can shoot, except for this park here and this park here, this is palm oil. So my research lies right here at this point where the soil meets the atmosphere. And maybe if you're sitting in the front, you're only, you can see some complicated things, but if you're sitting in the back, maybe you only see two things, grass and soil. But I'm inviting you to look at some of the other things that contribute to the biodiversity in this photo. These might be poppies right here. This might be daisy fleabane. Think about the insects that might be living in this. This looks pretty monoculturish, but there's rye grass or maybe that's goose grass and some other smaller grasses near the bottom. We'll have ladybugs and aphids, we'll have crickets, we'll have things that eat ladybugs and aphids and crickets. And then things get a little complicated when you go beneath the soil. Maybe you can see the earthworms. Uh, Maybe you can't, I can't see them. I used to be able to see them. But you can certainly see the, the impact of the earthworms. If you're sitting in the back, if you see the different colors of brown in the soil, those are tunnels um, provided by earthworms. The earthworms are beneath the soil. There will also be things like nematodes and microbes, both the soil microbes, which nobody can see in this room, and the microbes that are in the guts of the things that are living in this ecosystem. So this ecosystem, is actually pretty complicated. And there are a lot of ways to impact the biodiversity in this simple image right here. So what the worm lab does is we indirectly measure biodiversity. I would like to say that I send teams of students out to the Pampas in Indiana and we look at what happens to biodiversity when we grow crops using big agriculture, but that's not what we do. Instead, we try to model what's going on in this particular ecosystem. Right here, this is a list of some of my independent, I'm sorry, some of my dependent variables. These are the things that my students and I regularly measure. One of the things that we're interested in is the behavior of our model organisms. How do they change based on the exposure to <coughs> agrochemicals. The next thing that we measure includes stress test survival time and we devise this mostly for earthworms. We take an earthworm and we subject it to what we call the sidewalk test. We give it very intense light, we give it very intense heat, 
and we measure how long it lives, which is really if there's a worm hell, <coughs> me and my students are going there. But what the hypothesis underlying this terrible test is, is that the worms that have the metabolic resources to withstand the stress test for longer are worms that have been eating clean food and have been able to use their metabolic resources to support their immune system and to support growth. On the other hand, worms that have been having to use their immune system, their metabolic resources to bolster their immune system, they're not going to live in their, they're not going to survive so long in their stress test. We also measure body mass, biomass, survivorship. So spoiler alert, survivorship is a really boring variable because very few things that we study in the worm lab and we try to use realistic field doses very few of our organisms die from straight up contamination or exposure to contamination. And the other thing that we measure is nerve damage. We've added, we recently added a couple of other variables. One is herbicide type. So glyphosate and Roundup based or glyphosate based formulations are pretty tricky. There are between 300 and 450 glyphosate based herbicides, which are a lot of herbicides. And glyphosate itself comes in four different flavors. So uh, there was a lab in France that tried to back engineer some of them. They tried to back engineer 30 of them and they found 27 unique formulations. Now, so they have some things in common because they're all designed to penetrate the plant cell wall so that glyphosate can get in there and kill it. But exactly how they're tweaking it depends on the plant, depends on the soil acidity and other things that they won't tell us. It's industry secret. We are not allowed to know what that is. So imagine what that has to do for biodiversity. If you think back to that, that map that I had up and how much of that is planted with Roundup Ready crops and how much of that Roundup Ready crop is being sprayed with glyphosate, which we're exploring here, but also all of these industry secret contaminants so most of the time my lab is using the, the Roundup formulations because that's how farmers and growers are using it. The other variable that we um, try to control is recovery time, which I'll talk about in more detail later. We try to represent both what's happening in the tropics and in temperate regions because this is a global issue. This is a global contamination issue. And we've just recently started studying the impact of agriculture, I'm sorry, um, agrochemicals on freshwater systems. So here are our model organisms. So that nobody's disappointed, we in fact do have worms in the worm lab, but we also have other model organisms. We use the worms because for a couple of reasons. First of all, they are um, super easy to grow in a laboratory. Second of all, very few people feel sad when we kill them. More importantly, though, they are ecosystem engineers. They, pro they provide a whole suite of ecosystem services. And anybody who's from Long Island might know that they're not native to here. We could talk about that after. But in an agricultural setting where you're interested in growing plants, you really want worms there because they do a couple of things. They, most importantly, they put tunnels through the soil. And that allows for water to penetrate the soil surface. Additionally, when they're making those tunnels, they're coating those tunnels with a mucus coat. And that mucus is supporting and feeding a whole suite of microorganisms. So they are distributing microbes, they're distributing micronutrients, and they're allowing water to not flood the area. We use two species of worms, the red wiggler and the Asian crazy snake worm. We can talk about those later if you're interested in them. For to, to represent the tropics, we are using a very large and easy to study insect, the Madagascar hissing roach. The um, hissing roach is nice because it's big, which makes it super easy to study. And also it is itself uh, a soil invertebrate. And its ecosystem services are um, pretty remarkable. They act as pollinators in some places, and they also help eat leaf litter. Leaf litter. I'm putting the planaria up here, even though we don't have any publications involving the planaria, but we really, we will within the next year because we've been really busy studying the impact of glyphosate and leachate from plastics on 
uh, planaria. The unsung hero of the worm lab actually is microbes because we've gotten really busy studying the impact of um, all of this terrestrial pollution on the uh, both soil, soil microbes and the microbes inside the guts of our um, species, our worms. Front and center, I've got the soybean. We use two kinds of soybeans in the worm lab. We use Roundup Ready soybeans, which just came off patent a couple of years ago. I believe that our lab was one of the first labs to start studying the impact of Roundup Ready soybeans. And as a control, we also use heirloom organic soybeans. So I'm going to take us through a um, brief summary of all the publications that have come out of the worm lab in the last three years on this particular topic. I couldn't put a list of all the student names on here because there are so many of them, but every publication that I'm about to show you has undergraduate students on the author line. This particular project, uh, this ant farm that you see here was uh, devised by our very own graduate student, Matteo Mizek, and he ran a, a project with him and a whole bunch of undergraduates where they made these ant farms, which are actually worm farms, and allowed us to answer one of the really important questions associated with biodiversity in an agricultural setting. So if you think about the importance of earthworms as ecosystems engineers, if, they are, if we're relying on them to help control water penetration into the soil, then if Roundup is impeding their ability to move, they are going to have an indirect impact on biodiversity. We had hypothesized that exposing earthworms to Roundup was going to slow them down. But in fact, we found the opposite. We found that compared to, so again, I'm not gonna talk about dosage, but I'm going to tell you that consistently we use field realistic doses of all the contaminants I'm talking about here. So in the contaminated soil, earthworms spend a whole lot more time moving than in the control soil. I don't have a mechanism for it. I don't even know if worms are happy that they're spending that much more time moving. But if you're concerned about the actions about earthworms as ecosystems engineers, certainly adding Roundup isn't going to impede the ability to add tunnels to our soil. The next question that we devised, we devised in response to a question about climate change. So I don't know if you guys know Kathy Twist in anthropology, she's super interested in the impact in climate change on, uh, on I'm sorry, yes, climate change on food availability. And she asked me how earthworms were, were going to respond to climate change. And so as a result, we ran this project. However, when we looked at the results of this project, we realized that it speaks not just to the impact of climate change, but also the impact of using Roundup in tropical regions. Right here, these two columns represent Roundup in heated soil and Roundup in not heated soil. I'm sorry, Roundup, <laughs> get my bad words. Roundup in heated soil and heated soil without Roundup. So we looked at, I'm sorry, I know I'm a little bit. Those two yellow graphs are just showing the impact of Roundup in a heated soil environment. And you see there's no difference. The worms don't care about Roundup. If they do not, their stress test survival time does not change when you heat up the soil and add Roundup. On the other hand, this was unheated soil. This was room temperature soil. Worms respond pretty dramatically to Roundup exposure and that they um, die nearly half as fast. So what this means in terms of biodiversity is that maybe in temperate regions, well, wait, let me take a step back. We think that the underlying cause behind this is that the heat increased microbial growth, microbial activity. Glyphosate is broken down by microbes. And so what we're seeing right here is probably the impact of less glyphosate in the soil. So we're, we suspect that microbial action is making the soil safer for worms to live in. But that's good in both a climate change scenario and for applications of Roundup in the tropics, because it, it is um, indirectly telling us that biodiversity, at least in terms of worms and their associated microbes, is going to be less impacted. On the other hand, if we look at what's happening now, 
worms are responding pretty negatively. They're dying very quickly in their stress test when subjected to Roundup. The next question has to do with the Roundup formulations. I want to be clear in that growers never, never use glyphosate alone as a weed control mechanism. Growers always mix it with some formulation. So in a marine system, wait, I don't want to talk about marine, marine system yet. I just want to tell you what we found. What we did is we controlled the glyphosate salt type. I told you there were four, we used one. We used formulations that use this particular salt and we kept the dose the same. And we asked whether these two formulations, one is Roundup Ready to Use 3 and the other one is Roundup Super Concentrate. Uh, we looked at the effect on, on body mass. And you can see that for the formulations, they responded as um, though they were controls. And that is true for stress test survival time. On the other hand, worms who were exposed to straight up glyphosate had reduced biomass and reduced stress test survival time. This is contrary to what we find in marine systems. When we subject marine organisms to Roundup formulations, they find the formulations much more toxic than straight up glyphosate. So what's going on in a terrestrial system is a little bit different than what's going on in a marine system. And there are not a whole lot of representations of studies of this type where we look at different formulations on terrestrial organisms. Uh, I, there's one more thing I want to say about this. This test, this experiment ran 40 days. Okay, so then my students wanted to move into the tropics. And I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, let's look at what's happening in the tropics. So I have to give a shout out to this particular student undergraduate, mega, then undergraduate, mega Canbar. She spearheaded all of these experiments plus two more. This experiment right here was run in conjunction with our um, um, with Marvin O'Neill in undergraduate biology. And what we did is we exposed these, these roaches to dietary Roundup and we looked at what happened to their, um, their, their nerve health. We hooked them up to an action potential machine and we measured how quickly signals went up and down the nerves. And you can see that by eating Roundup, their nerve velocity is, the action potential velocity is decreased significantly. This experiment right here has to do with respiration. And we ran this project with Niels Vulcanborn and Ian Dwyer right here in SOMAS. And you can see that roaches exposed to round dietary Roundup end up panting, essentially. They end up uh, with almost a 30% increase in respiration. But the most remarkable finding has to do with the final experiment, which I do believe was Jeff Levington's idea. But Mega and her brother built a hamster wheel for cockroaches out of Legos and a 3D printer and measured coordination for these roaches running on a hamster wheel, a cockroach wheel in this case. And you can see that in fact, roaches are pretty uncoordinated if they've been eating Roundup. And I want to circle back about to what this means about biodiversity, right? We've got this, this creature, this organism that is eating realistic amounts of, of glyphosate, realistic amounts of, and we don't know, it could be any of the top secret uh, um, ingredients as well. It is not dying. It is not losing weight. I didn't put those graphs up here, but none of them died. And none of them lost weight. Even the juveniles didn't lose weight from eating glyphosate. But if we're counting on this creature to help eat the forest floor and help pollinate the plants, they clearly are going to be less capable of doing it. We're not measuring reproduction. Reproduction would be interesting here, but these guys are having a hard time breathing. Their nerves aren't working quite right and they've lost their coordination. So if we're relying on these guys to pollinate our plants, we could be in trouble. So one of the questions that we had is that it was pretty clear from a whole bunch of pilot studies that we didn't actually publish that Roundup was more detrimental to earthworms than we were seeing in our, in our publications. And we had this idea that maybe timing was important. We use pretty consistent soil, we use pretty consistent temperatures, uh, we use uh, pretty consistent species, but yet we could get pretty different answers. 
depending on the length of time of the experiment. So in this experiment, we gave the worms a one day pulse at day zero, field dose, and we watched what happened at day seven. On day seven, they're dying really fast during the stress test. At day 14, they're dying fast, but not as fast as the previous week. But by the third week, they've almost recovered. You can't tell from the stress test survival time the difference between the control worms and the worms who had been living with Roundup. At the same time we were running that experiment, we were using a, a crude but um, cheap and available way to measure microbial biomass. Uh, a company called Microbiometer gives us as many test kits as we want. And we measured how microbial biomass responded similarly to the, po to the pulse. So day zero, we exposed them to Roundup, but you can hear here that see the clean soil and the Roundup soil, they're both showing really big jumps in microbial biomass seven days after exposure. That's probably because we buy this soil in bags. It's OMRI certified, which means it doesn't have chemicals in it, it doesn't have pharmaceuticals in it, it doesn't have herbicides or pesticides or plastics in it. It's supposed to be very clean. So we take it out of the bags, we put it in a cement mixer, we add water to it, we aerate it, and we add worms to it. And the microbes apparently respond to this attention by increasing in biomass. By week two though, you can see that while the clean soil has returned to baseline, the contaminated soil has dropped significantly in microbial biomass. And by week three, like the worms, they've recovered. And again, this seems to be good news for people who want to keep using Roundup in an agricultural setting because the worms are recovering after one pulse, one realistic pulse, and the microbes, at least in terms of biomass, are also recovering. In the final study I'm going to overview here, this one is in um, revision. We considered the idea that maybe the Roundup ready seeds themselves could be a source of contamination from the earthworm's perspective. And what this, this top graph here with the green bars, we must have rerun this study five or six times, and these are really consistent results. Worms that are living with organic heirloom seeds get bigger. Worms that are living with Roundup ready seeds do not get as big. It made us wonder about the mechanism. So my students and I were were sitting around in a lab meeting wondering what would be driving it that we could actually study. Because the worm lab being run by undergraduates, we don't have all of the resources that um, um, other labs have. And one of the things that the students said, well, maybe the Roundup Ready plants are bigger and they're taking more micronutrients from the soil, thereby causing worms to be smaller. So we looked at plant biomass, and you can see on these graphs right here, we used organic seeds with competition and without competition, and we used Roundup Ready seeds with competition and without competition. And you can see that on average, the plant biomass for the organic seeds is slightly bigger than that for the Roundup Ready seeds, and particularly competition matters here. So if you are a Roundup Ready seed competing with anybody else, you are significantly smaller than the other options. Well, plant height could be a thing. I don't know if any of you guys have ever tried to grow soybeans, but it's not difficult to get them to be leggy. And leggy soybeans aren't something you really want to uh, have. But we measured plant height also as a way to get at sort of how much micronutrients the plants were using. And the answer actually is clearer here than with biomass itself in that Roundup Ready plants are shorter. Um, with or without competition, they're shorter. So if you think about the acreage we devote, the hectares we devote to Roundup Ready crops, we can see that we're getting less plant biomass per hectare than if we were using, in fact, the organic plants, especially if we're growing the plant, if there's any competition. Then we wondered if maybe soil was dry, I'm sorry, if, if water was driving this difference. Because the one sure way to kill a worm isn't with cadmium or plastic or Roundup. The surest way to kill a worm is by drying it out. They do not like dry soil, they like wetter soil. 
So in this final run of this experiment, we measured water use. We measured how much water plants were using. And you can see over here that the Roundup Ready plants and organic plants grown with competition use more water than the organic plant grown alone. This is not driving, water use is not driving the difference in worms though, because in this final project, we held water constant. We just measured how much plants used. So if you think about what this study implies for biodiversity in an agricultural setting, we are devoting much of our acreage. So more than 90% of the, of the soybean crops grown in the United States are Roundup Ready. We're devoting much of that to a plant that doesn't get as big. Now, I, we'd like to ideal, ideally measure yield. I don't, we stopped this project at the third trifoliate stage, but we're getting less biomass per acre and we're using more water per acre. We're generating fewer worms than, we're uh, at least less worm biomass by using this. So ge genetically modified seeds themselves may in fact be a driver of biodiversity reduction, even without the contamination of the chemical itself. Okay, so before I continue about what this means for our future research, I wanna give a nod to the 42 undergraduate students who are co-authors on the papers I just told you about. Not all the worm lab papers, but all the worm lab papers that have to do with any flavor of Roundup. I've got five graduate students on my author lines, two other professors, one in SOMAS, one in undergraduate biology, and 11 high school students. Okay, this brings us to our knowledge gaps. One of the interesting things about all of the studies that I presented is that in some way, shape, or form, microbes are always implicated. And although the worm lab can measure microbial biomass, it's, that's a pretty crude tool. We, we were doing soil respiration, which is even a cruder tool. And microbial bio, what's going on in microbe land is pretty interesting. So for instance, if we look at this graph right here, we can see 14 days after being exposed to Roundup, there's been a significantly, there's a significant decrease in microbial biomass that then recovers. But we don't know what species of microbes, we don't know the species diversity, um, that it that what we don't know what the community looked like on day zero versus day 21. And it turns out that if you're interested in being able to grow plants effectively, which is what we're trying to do when we're trying to feed 8 billion people, you have to pay a lot of attention to the microbes that are living in the soil. So for instance, if we just look at the soybean alone, these nodules are caused by a very particular bacteria and the plant actually will not make fruit without these nodules. So we really need to pay attention to what's going on for, to grow our crops for plant health. We need to watch out for what's going on with the microbes. I know I said that like a Klingon, but I think you got my point. I'm not, we're not the first people to think that. Jackie sent me this paper this morning. She's like, hey, did you see this? It's so cool. And uh, this is a graph that, that's coming out of China where they have um, in their coastal waters, they have a suite of super common contaminants, which aren't glyphosate, but are still agrochemicals. This one happens to be atrazine. And they ran an experiment where they exposed their, their particular communities to atrazine. And you can see pretty major shifts in microbial community based on exposure to agrochemicals. And this is at the phylum and class level. People have been doing this in soil systems. This is a paper from um, the Science of the Total Environment from 2016. And they looked at how soil communities change with typical crop plants and adding of glyphosate. And these don't look very different. But if you look at this orange band right here, this is cyanobacteria, and the cyan cyanobacteria is getting bigger. It's a subtle change, but it's a, an unwanted change. We're not the first people to worry about what's happening in gut microbiomes either. I know this is a, a terrible and busy graph, but this, this paper was studied, was published in 2018 in PNAS, and these researchers looked at how the gut microbial communities changed in honeybees. 
and they fed honeybees two do doses of glyphosate. And the only thing I want you to see here is how many of these graphs are indicated as being significantly different. So with honeybees, we can impact the gut microbial community by adding glyphosate to it. We ran a pilot study of our own where we looked at changes in soil community associated with changes in worm gut microbial community. We started this project a while ago, uh, I think um, five or six years ago with uh, Somas as Nolan Daly. And at that point, Claire Tucker was an undergraduate and she and Nolan collected this data uh, with the help of students from the worm lab. Liliana, Jackie and I have been updating this for some of the grants that we've had in submission. And what we're doing here is we're feeding earthworms Roundup and we're looking at how that change in diet impacts the microbial community, not just in the, so not just in the worm guts where you expect a difference, but also in the soil. And we're particularly interested in the species that, so the green represents Roundup uh, exposed. So the species that increase with Roundup addition and the species that, I hope I said increase, and the species that decrease with Roundup. And you can see that Roundup is having an impact on both the worm gut microbial communities and the soil communities. One thing I wanna add is that we really understand how Roundup impacts plants very well. This is a pretty stylized image right here. And it shows what's happening inside a plant when you are adding glyphosate. So this is the shikimate pathway and plants use it to make chorismate and then all of these other enzymes. To be clear, none of us in this room use the shikimate pathway. Reptiles don't use it, amphibians don't use it, birds don't use it, mammals don't use it. When it was first put on the market, it was put on the market as only plants use the shikimate pathway which is great because it means it only kills plants. And so what happens is as we're, as we're going through this metabolic pathway, we get to the point where the plant is expecting EPSPS synthase to bind to PEP. And instead of that happening, glyphosate binds to PEP. And within hours or sometimes days, the plant dies. We're not the only people to worry about what happens to non-target organisms right here. This is a uh, an image that was published in 2020 in Trends of Plant Science, where we've got the shikimate pathway, which is relying on EPSBS, making chorus main. If we interrupt that, we're interrupting all these downstream pathways. It will lead to direct impulse it, um, impacts on these plants, but maybe also indirect impacts on all of these other associated creatures. It may have direct impacts on the pathogens, the fungi, the endophytes and the bacteria. So when glyphosate was put, first, put, first put on the market, everybody said it's super safe and it has turned out to be pretty safe for an herbicide. And they said that only plants care about it. Well, it turns out that about half the bacteria that you meet are sensitive, use EPSPS and half don't. For her honors thesis, Clara Tucker worked with Liliana and Jackie to, I think Jackie, but Clara, Clara for her honors thesis made this, uh, use this logo, Jackie made the logo. And if you are the kind of bacteria that is sensitive to glyphosate, you look like this. And if you are the kind of bacteria that is resistant to glyphosate, you look like this. And our team got really busy in, uh, using the NCBI data set looking at over 40,000 bacteria and dividing them into two piles, class one and class two. And our hypothesis was that microbial communities that increased, like I was showing you with the worm gut and the soil, microbial communities that were increased, species that are increasing should be this resistant type. And ones that decrease should be the sensitive kind. And we're getting really busy knowing the answer to that. Uh, this is our regular Friday lab meeting. We don't have an answer for that yet, but this is uh, uh, um, an image that we've been using in our grant proposals. 
We could be wrong, however. It could be more complicated than that. This is another image that we're using for the uh, grant, the NSF grant that Jackie Lily and I, Liliana and I are working on now. And this is cyanobacteria. So cyanobacteria is traditionally labeled class one sensitive, but it turns out, especially in aquatic systems, that if you add Roundup, cyanobacteria are pretty happy about that and their populations get pretty bigger, get bigger. One of the ways that that could happen that instead of using that EPSPS mechanism that I was just telling you about, they, they have um, the ability to use this phosphonate pathway instead. And the three of us are working on a grant to try to uncover that mechanism a little more clearly. We have predictions about ways in which the microbial communities will shift depending on which of the mechanisms are more common in um, bacterial settings. So to summarize, this image right here is from 2017 in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution. If you are really concerned in the age of the Anthropocene, when we're really concerned about the impact of human behavior on biodiversity, maybe we need to start thinking about the way that human behavior is impacting soil communities, particularly microbial communities. But even back in 2017, people were thinking about the ways that changing the soil communities were affecting the insects, the invertebrates, the other invertebrates, the plants, and the higher plants. And just as in the honeybee and the worm gut microbiome, maybe the human gut microbiome is also being impacted by our big um, push to use agrochemicals. I was in a talk, I was at a talk last Friday in chemistry where the speaker from Harvard was really interested in the way that gut E. coli in cancer patients was causing cancer. And she spent the whole lecture talking about the mechanism by which E. coli was causing cancer and colorectal cancer in 20 to 30 year old people. And it made me think that it was pretty consistent with subtle shifts in gut microbial communities that we're seeing right now in honeybees and in earthworms. Whereas a, a subtle shift in human gut microbial communities could be making room for E. coli. And once the E. coli populations get big enough, they can be touching the epithelial lining of the intestines and that gives rise to cancer. I don't want to end this talk on an unhappy note. So I'm talking, I want to talk about two potential solutions that I have been actively working on and considering. This one I was just getting ready to start before the pandemic. And if you make a list, my idea here is if you make a list of the bacteria that are negatively impacted by glyphosate application, you can make a soil amendment that you would apply perhaps three weeks after you apply Roundup. And that way, by adding the missing microbes, you might be better capable of keeping the soil community in balance. A more visionary solution involves robots. It might be time to think about doing away with the agrochemical approach to weed control and think about replacing it with robots. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the app on your phone called iNaturalist, but right now your phone is really pretty good at using leaf recognition software. It's really possible to use it, to use iNaturalist to, maybe you can not tell the species of goldenrod part so well, but you can certainly tell the difference between soybeans and water hemp. So I have been working with a team from um, the Institute for the Conservation of Tropical Environments, Jesse, Jesse. Um, Charlie Patterson, who's in the School of Engineering, and Anurag Puar, who is also a professor of engineering. And we are working on making a robot. We're developing it for vineyards because that's what we have here on Long Island. This part of the robot is smart and autonomous and can just in our, in our big visionary scheme of things, it moves like a very smart Roomba. And then this arm of the plant will recognize and electrocute the associated weeds. So we have two potential solutions to this problem. 
so that we can keep feeding 8 billion people without so impacting bio soil biodiversity so dramatically. Thank you. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Yeah, Gordon. How does it get the matches from probably a biomass? How, I'm sorry, with your mask. Are you asking? How does it measure? Yeah, it uses light frequency, and so essentially you take um, you take soil and you add some salt, which I think acts as, a, acts as a detergent, and you shake it up, and then you add some top secret stuff and you put it on little films, and then you take pictures of it with your cell phone, and your cell phone looks at um, uses how much uh, how much light, the color of it essentially. And it can, I'd be happy to show you the kit. Okay, I'd like to see Yeah, they're super cheap. And uh, Microbiometer has um, been really generous with giving us as many as we can use in the hopes that we will publish papers with it. And we've done so twice. So um, it's not the best tool, but it's certainly appropriate for, the, for what I'm doing with the undergraduates in my lab now. Excuse me, Sharon, could you please repeat the questions from the audience because um, no one on Zoom can hear. So Gordon was asking how microbiometer works to measure microbial biomass. Okay. Also, and the answer was... Yeah. Uh, okay. We heard your answer. Cody Garrison has his hand raised. Um, and maybe you could unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Hi. Um, great talk. I was just um, curious for the microbes uh, that are increasing in abundance with the Roundup. Um, do you know what their functional role is in the community and maybe how the overall uh, functional potential of the community is changing because of these various increases and decreases in abundance? I don't know the answer to that, but there, there is a published body of literature that answers just that question. It turns out that how the microbial systems change really depend on what your initial soil state was and what contaminant you used. But there are people who have looked at the way that different agrochemicals impact the, the function of um, the different microbial communities. But I don't have a specific answer because I haven't measured that in the worm lab. So I imagine that for all the ways you can um, find microbial, uh, the, the specific functions changing, probably they all exist someplace in the literature, depending on the contaminant and the medium. Great, thank you. Yeah. OK, Gordon has another question. So the class Glyphosate? Glyphosate uh, soybeans. Yeah, the Roundup Ready soybeans. So they're smaller plants, right? Yeah. Okay. And they have Marsovia root not thought about looking at how Roundup affects. Uh, repeat the question. Yeah, thanks for the reminder. So Gordon asked if. The, if we have thought about looking at the way that glyphosate applications would impact the, um, the um, nitrogen fixing bacteria that are famously associated with the root systems of um, soybeans. And yes, we've thought about it. Right now, our specific aim is to, re we really want to uncover the mechanism first though. So, if answering your question was something I could do with undergraduates in my lab, I would definitely, that would de that is on our list of things to do. But for working with my colleagues, Liliana, Jackie, and I would really want to get to the bottom of the, the mechanism. So if you have ways that you think that we can do that with undergraduates, so, and we're doing it on a shoestring, right? That's, we're not, we don't have big funds for doing that. That is something we would be interested in doing. 
Okay, wait, I can see chat questions. Let's see. Okay. Nope. I, have a, I have a question, Sharon, it's Malcolm. Hi, Malcolm. Hi, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, some months ago, I saw a documentary about a lone Canadian farmer, wheat farmer, who uh, collected his own seeds and in, included some Monsanto seeds that blew across from his neighbor, and they went after him in a legal way and went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and they ruled in favor of the farmer. But And I see here national, uh, I'm reading a national uh, public radio story about Bayer, who took over Monsanto to pay more than $10 billion to resolve cancer lawsuits over, over uh, Roundup with 125,000 people. And I'm just wondering, I mean, have you had any harassment from the companies or they're trying to uh, discredit your research? I have not been harassed by Monsanto or Bayer, but I have been in contact via ResearchGate with some of the environmental scientists at Bayer slash Monsanto. And we've only had good communications. So, but on the other hand, if I could sit down the president of Bayer, I would say, hey man, that stuff is so cool. Your genetic modifications and your agrochemicals, but what about robots? That's what I would say to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bob has his hand up, Aller. Hi, Bob. Hi, Sharon. Uh, let me turn on my video here so you see me a little bit anyway. Um, yeah, that was an extremely intriguing presentation. I, I have a question that concerns how you relate experiments that are done on individuals in the lab to the populations in the field. That is, do you make whole community measurements of response in under field conditions? Um, not yet. Or not, okay. Uh, right now, the, the publications that I just walked you through are publications that are by their very, that, that they are based on experiments that by their nature are limited by the fact that it has to include undergraduate research and it also has to be something that we can do in the worm lab. So I do not yet have NSF funding to look at actual, um, like I said at the beginning, I would love to send students out to Indiana and Colombia and Brazil and actually measure responses in real time. And it'd be really awesome to start to look at community changes as you take virgin land and you change it into long-term agricultural land. But, um, I don't think anybody's done it. There are actually there are a couple of studies out of um, out of Europe where they've done like twelve year studies where they've looked at the the change. And it, uh, one indicating one important study shows that like after twelve years of glyphosate application, you depress the you depress especially the fungal communities in the soil in such a way that the plants are it's harder to grow plants there. Um, and that particular researcher has, I don't know, three or four papers on that topic. But I myself, uh, as I tried to make clear, uh, you know, all of my studies are indirect. So we have to sort of imagine if it's true in a lab, what it would mean for the real world. Right. As a limitation. Uh, along those uh, same lines, I'm not sure this is coming through because I seem to be frozen up here, but um, uh, I'm wondering if there is a size or age dependence on the response. Do you hear that? Yeah. Who's talking? This is Bob Aller. Oh, oh, it's Bob again. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Bob again. Um, yeah, we, there is actually a, a size response. So we only use, okay, wait, I'm going to talk about earthworms and then I'm going to talk about cockroaches. With earthworms, there is we, one of the ways we control for it is only using adult earthworms. And it's really easy to tell adults from juveniles because adults have something called a platellum. And then the other way that we control for size is we make sure that before we run an experiment that all biomass and all treatments is the same, or if we're using individuals, that the average is, uh, we use the, we make sure that the distribution of the worm size is the same. 
But to answer your, your question, if you have no contamination at all and you're doing the stress test survival time, then uh, body size is a very strong predictor of how long the worms will live. So bigger worms are stronger for the light and the heat torture chamber. That effect goes away when we use Roundup. So in that paper where I was talking about climate change, there is a graph in there where we got to the bottom of the interaction between body size and exposure to contamination. So bigger worms are less, bigger worms who are exposed to Roundup are less capable of surviving than bigger worms not exposed to Roundup. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Nick. Sharon, um, have you looked at the uh, accumulation of the Roundup by the worms and also whether or not uh, if, if they do take up the Roundup, apparently they do because they're effective, um, it, to what extent um, uh, Renda uh, stays in the worm for how long and whether it can be passed on to animals that eat the worms, like birds? Such interesting questions. Okay, for those of you on Zoom, Nick Fisher just asked if I knew anything about the accumulation, the bioaccumulate, the accumulation of uh, glyphosate in earthworms and whether that could biomagnify. And in fact, that graph that I had up that uh, we were looking at the microbiome of the soil and the, uh, in both the soil and the worm gut, we, by we, I'm talking about um, here at Somas and McElroy really helped us use um, ELISA test kits to see if there was uh, glyphosate accumulating in the worm tissue. And the answer to that is yes. So poor Ann and I have used ELISA kits like eight times and we have to keep diluting it's the accumulation in the flesh of the worms is so high that we keep getting it off the charts. So I don't know what the exact number is. It's high. Whether it accumulates up the food chain, I don't know. I don't know that that's something that I can answer exactly in the worm lab because I'm trying to stay away from studies that involve IACOC. And so I would have to look at things that eat earthworms naturally that don't have backbones. And we haven't done that yet. Um, I would love to know the answer to that. In fact, there is only one published study that looks at the accumulation of glyphosate in earthworm tissue. And it's a particular earthworm that lives in freshwater sediment. And that particular earthworm does in fact accumulate as well. So my compost worm isn't the only one that can accumulate it. Good question. Fun question. As Malcolm again, Nick's comment uh, reminds me of the, uh, the the contributions of Charlie Worcester, emeritus professor of SOMAS, and uh, the DDT story in the early seventies. And I was speaking to Charlie yesterday, and you know, there was some indication that DDT and DDE were possible human carcinogens. But there's renewed interest, and apparently a new documentary is about to be made. With Charlie at the center of it about the DDT story. So I'm going to try and Mark will show me how I'm going to send the recording of today's session to Charlie lives in Maryland for his interest. Well, DDT is a pretty uh, remarkable contaminant in that it's half-life in soil. It looks like it's about a hundred years. Wow. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> putting it out there once puts it out there for a really long time. My microbes can't break it down very easily. So, Kate, you had a question. Related to both what Nick's question and what Malcolm was commenting on with um, uh, chlorinated um, uh, pesticides, what's known, what's the half, like what's known about degradation times of um, glyphosate in soil and how dependent is that on temperature on microbial communities or like what's the range of degradation times then also think about degradation, you know, what's taken up into something. Right, so for those of you on Zoom, uh, Kate was asking about the half-life of glyphosate in soil systems and, um, and then more questions, variations on that theme. So, the, uh, the, okay, so interestingly, one of the things that my undergraduates have been studying is the, uh, which is funny given the pandemic, 
they really got interested in the impact of ivermectin and the half-life of ivermectin and whether or not plants could, I know it seems like I'm changing topics right here, but they, they really wanted to know whether garden crops could uptake ivermectin because they were worried about horse wormer, horse dewormer being in their lettuce. And it required us to understand what the half-life of ivermectin was. And it's really, really predictable. Almost no matter what animal gut it goes through, almost no matter what state the horse stall is in, it has a half-life of about 12 days. On the other hand, glyphosate has a half-life that ranges from two days to more than 360 days. It's super unpredictable. It depends on how acidic the soil is. It depends on the soil type. It probably depends on things like what sort of microbes are in there that can break it down. Uh, so it's a messy, it's got a really messy half-life. The only way to really control it is to be doing, continually using like ELISA test plates to be seeing where you are at any particular time. And ELISA test plates are a pain in the ass. I'm sorry, like, I'm sure that some of you out there are like, oh, I can do them, come join our lab. I find them super annoying. Um, it requires pipetting, which is hard. Um, it requires like professional pipetting, which is hard. The, the test kits themselves are run between 600 and $800. So we try to use them very judiciously, which means that although it'd be really nice with all of, and, and theoretically possible to know how much glyphosate was in the soil for the um, graphs I just showed you, we don't, I don't know the answer. It's, it requires a deep skill set and a little more money than I generally have access to. Yeah. All right. Well, we ran 10 minutes over. All right. Thank you guys for all of your questions and for your attention. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sharon. And um, see you all next week.